Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Library of Australia. For those of you who are joining us online, we are going to give it a few minutes just because it is a very cold, cold, blustery evening in Canberra. So there may be a little bit of disturbance as people come in slightly late. But welcome to this very special event, 2022 Reckoning with Power and Privilege. My name is Cathy Oates. I'm the Director of Communications and Marketing here at the National Library. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge Australia's First Nations peoples, the first Australians, as the traditional owners and custodians of this land and give my respect to elders, past and present, and through them to all Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Thank you for attending this event, coming to you from the National Library building, which is on beautiful Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. Here with us tonight are Mark Kenny, Michelle Grattan, and Peter Martin to discuss 2022, Reckoning with Power and Privilege, which is a collection of the conversation's most insightful essays from leading thinkers explaining how and why these potent forces continue to shape our world and how those with privilege of power don't always prevail. The Conversation Australia and New Zealand is a unique not-for-profit collaboration between academics and journalists publishing research-based news and analysis online. The National Library of Australia is thrilled to partner with them for this event. Dr Carolyn Fisher had planned to be here tonight on the panel. She is now unable to attend, for which she sends her apologies. Mark Kenny is Professor at the Australian National University's Australian Studies Institute. Thank you, Mark, for stepping in tonight. Michelle Grattan is the Chief Political Correspondent at The Conversation and Associate Editor, Politics, at the University of Canberra. Peter Martin is the Business and Economic Economy Editor of The Conversation and a visiting fellow at the Crawford School of Public Policy at the Australian National University. Please join me in welcoming Mark Kenny, Michelle Grattan, and Peter Martin to discuss 2022, Reckoning with Power and Privilege. Thanks very much, Cathy. I hope everyone can hear me and welcome to everyone who's uh, turned out to this event. It's a really uh, lovely to see all of your faces here. Um, now, in keeping with the theme of the latest book from The Conversation, as Cathy mentioned, 2022, Reckoning with Power and Privilege, we'll be discussing the first six months of the Albanese government and the challenges it faces on things like inflation, energy prices, climate change, industrial relations. We're going to be doing well if we get through all of these <laughs> things, of course. Um, and enshrining a voice to Parliament in the Constitution. We'll also take a look at how the opposition is travelling and perhaps uh, also the, 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 uh, the advent of this uh, particularly unique uh, crossbench that we have in the lower house and, and indeed in the Senate. So there's a lot to cover and of course there will be time, I will make sure there is time or we will make sure there is time for questions from you in the audience. And when we come to that, um, we'll probably try and uh, just slow you down enough so that you've got a microphone in your hand uh, and we'll try and have those, as my friend um, Colin uh, Steele from ANU says, we like to have our questions actually end with a question mark. Um, <laughs> and I get a snigger every time when I say that, but people know exactly what we're referring to. Uh, there is a temptation sometimes to make comments and that's, that's fine, although we probably don't really have the... Uh, the forum set up for that. So we'll come to that uh, when we do, but um, we look forward to your questions and we may <coughs> even get one or two online, which uh, Cathy will, um, will deal with uh, should they come in. So let's begin with the Albanese government, Albanese government, first six months in power. Uh, Michelle Grattan, what sort of a start do you think Anthony Albanese and his government has made? Well, before I go to that, uh, thank you to everyone for coming through this uh, another terrible um, blustery sort of uh, day. It's a, a, a real privilege that people do come out to these events. I think Anthony Albanese 
has made a very, very solid start. I think that uh, this week he would be really pleased with uh, getting a meeting with the Chinese president and if not resetting that relationship and, and the experts say we should be careful not to see it as some sort of dramatic total reset but it's an incredibly important step I think uh, <coughs> for this uh, relationship to have um, resumed, re-engaged. It's part of a a somewhat wider attempt by China, I think, to reduce tensions for a variety of reasons, but that's an important step in foreign policy. Clearly, Anthony Albanese has been anxious to uh, begin his prime ministership with as much activity as possible, and so we've seen a lot of legislation and we'll see a flurry of uh, activity in this last uh, fortnight of Parliament uh, to come that starts next week. One important observation I think I'd make about his Prime Ministership so far is that he's taking a somewhat helicopter view of, of the job. Partly this has been imposed by the fact that he's done a lot and has to have done a lot of travel and I think that's very justified. But I think it also more widely, his style is to leave a lot of detail to the team rather than be in the weeds of every issue. Now, whether that will continue, whether he'll be able to continue that, given the problems that the country's facing and most immediately the need to craft an energy policy, we'll see. But that's the style at the moment. Yeah, just before we go to uh, some of the economic uh, angles uh, with, with Peter, I'll just dwell on that uh, point you just made for a moment because it's an interesting one. We saw with John Howard uh, a tendency to have to answer questions and get involved in any number of things and portfolios, but things happening in popular culture and the like. Kevin Rudd then sort of turbocharged that. We saw mm. him, uh, um, you know, very much part of the sort of social media and the new emerging 24-hour news cycle and so forth. Albanese before he was elected, was citing a Bob Hawke as his uh, sort of example, you know, the idea of collective <coughs> government but ministers having very strong responsibility for their... And, and autonomy really effectively and cabinet working collectively and so forth. That's what you're referring to there? Yes, but I think um, really Bob Hawke did get involved in a, a fair bit of detail. Yes, he left a, a lot of... Uh, areas to his ministers, but he, I think, was more involved than Albanese is. And remember, of course, uh, he was very much steeped in economic issues. So uh, he, d he had a, a strong office and he, in the economic issues, he was really um, down there in the detail often. And, and on some occasions, of course, had a, a restraining influence on his treasurer, um, who, who was um, highly active. <laughs> but, look, I would stress that it's early days yes. and, and we uh, don't know how this is all going to work out, but I think Albanese has not, by nature, been uh, a details person, a, a highly... Um, Highly details person. Yes, it's really interesting. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see that play out. Let's turn, Peter, to the sort of economic dimensions. Of course, they always uh, lurk very strongly in, in the background of all politics. You know, what do they say? It's the economy, the economy is stupid. Um, what, what, uh, what, what has happened in 2022 economically? And did the government rise to the challenge? Well, what's happened is what no one expected. Right. I know this because the conversation at the beginning of the year surveys leading economists about the year ahead. Our story was headlined, Top Economists Expect RBA to Hold Rates Low in 2022. That, that was, that was a head. They these that these from, are the experts. Might right? have got that from Philip Lowe. Uh, Lowe. And then, uh, but of course, we have subheadings. And a subheading read, Inflation Not Yet a Problem, which was true at the mm. time. So, uh, basically, no one saw... Everything that would have... Uh, no one saw the war, of course, the invasion of Ukraine. But um, no one saw this coming. In retrospect, 
you can see why the inflation happened. You can see that there were shortages of chips and there would have been because of COVID. We'd had two years of COVID. Shortage of, of workers, as many as a fifth of the Australian workforce not turning up on any given day, right? Um, uh, and you can see what this would do to prices. Pent and up you demand can, as yeah, well. Yeah, and pent up demand from all of the money that had been saved when people couldn't spend. You could see all of that in retrospect. No one saw it at the time. So when, um, you know, no one who answered surveys saw the extent of it at the time. Um, so uh, the Treasurer is not delivering the sort of budget perhaps he might have expected. He, he, he said in October, uh, Jim Chalmers said, look, uh, I will in this October budget deliver on the election promises, and he did, uh, but he cut back everywhere so as not to sort of add to the Reserve Bank's problems. It was easy to cut back because if you have a budget only six months before a budget, a lot of the spending that uh, uh, I guess Josh Frydenberg and Scott Morrison had started hadn't really started. The cheques hadn't been signed, so he could cancel all of them. And um, he, he sort of, the, the budget, his first budget was a placeholder, was saying, all right, I'm not going to spend to make things worse apart from extra money for the floods. I'm going to fund my promises and uh, the rest of it is watch this space and I will be agile. One thing I think you, you're talking about um, the sort of style of ministry, um, it, it, there's another dimension to that. So there's, will you, if you are the Prime Minister, uh, you know, uh, give ministers autonomy? And I think the Treasurer has a lot of autonomy. The other is, will you as Treasurer, or as any other minister, um, cede uh, power, uh, consult with your department instead of outside advisors? So the the previous Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, uh, infamously said just before COVID when he sort of had to do the opposite, we're not going to uh, take advice from public servants. Uh, we're going to decide things uh, You ourselves. do the delivery, we'll do the yeah, thinking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He said that. And mm. then, of course, um, you know, months later, he had to do the exact opposite when he was desperate for advice from, you know, uh, you know powerhouse of people who knew stuff. Uh, this Treasurer has appointed uh, people from the Treasury to his office, as well as the departmental liaison staff, um, and is using his department. So it's like a return to, I'm not sure when the old days were, but, you know, I, I guess it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like a return to the old days when the government trusted the public service, used the public service, and uh, I've no doubt, you know, as... Uh, someone who was in one of those departments that, you know, if you've got a building of 800 people and you use them, that's a really good idea. So I, I think that sort of um, is a reason to be optimistic. Yes, it is interesting. I, I wrote um, just before the budget about um, a, a speech he gave to Treasury officials where he thanked them very much for their contribution and actually said, look, this is our budget, this is the government's budget, this is Treasury's budget. You know, it was a very sort of collegiate uh, mood that he was, and collective mood that he was attaching around it, which is, was, a, was a significant sort of... Um, just on that, just related shift. for Canberra, we have a Prime Minister who lives in Canberra at the Lodge. Yeah, it's an interesting dimensional change as well. Just one final thing on that expectation about inflation, though. You say very few people predicted it, um, but... At, like, orthodox economics suggests if you pump $300 billion into the economy, it's going to have a stimulatory effect. Uh, and that's what actually had gone on over those previous couple of years. Yeah, I think what we thought was, we, being orthodox economists, was, um, <clears throat> we've said, sure, you're going to get that and you're going to get inflation, but it hasn't happened yet. And let's see, let's see how much more money we can spend. I mean, Frydenberg's last budget, they got this huge windfall from changed commodity prices and other things. Uh, he spent half of that rather than saved it. So, you know, effectively borrowed uh, $45 billion extra dollars over four years. Borrowed a lot. And um, then said, right, I'm going to spend this and see how far I can push unemployment down because inflation hasn't mm. bitten yet. 
Reminds me of Krakenite. You remember Krakenite? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they used to have it in Canberra up until recently. But, that, that's um, true. Well, we, I think we, we called it you know, Krakenite we, in South Australia. We, we had it in Adelaide, yeah, yeah. right? So you'd, uh, you'd think, gee, you know, I can light that cracker and nothing bad has happened. Um, so get closer next time. Nothing bad's happened. And um, you just see how low I can push unemployment without stirring inflation. Hasn't well, stirred high. yet. Yeah. Hasn't stirred yet. Uh, and, you know, Frydenberg, I, I think, was justified in doing that because uh, we have uh, 100,000 uh, of what used to be 200,000 long-term unemployed who are no longer uh, long-term unemployed. Mm. And that has changed people's lives. I mean, it's benefited all of us, We've got people to work for us, you know. But it, it's changed lives in ways that, uh, you know, are incredibly valuable. Um, and he, he decided to do that until inflation stirred. And mm. inflation hadn't been stirring until it did. Until it did. Now, that brings us, Michelle, to, I suppose, the political dimension of inflation because it then comes along and changes completely the calculus for the new government, doesn't it? Um, no longer, unlike the two previous, tre or two previous crises that, that governments had faced, I'm thinking the GFC in 2008 and then COVID, this Treasurer suddenly doesn't have what, they, what the Treasurers, Wayne Swan and and uh, um, Josh Frydenberg had in those, in those subsequent crises, he didn't have the ability to spend his way out of it. Well, that's right. And, uh, of course, the changed economic situation and, and the, the Ukraine war was, was a mm. major, <coughs> major thing in this meant that uh, promises that had been made in the election became difficult to fulfil or more contested. Uh, the difficult to fulfil was getting wages moving and, and that uh, people would uh, soon see their real wages uh, going up. Well, now we know that their real wages won't be going up on present predictions before 2024 and who knows whether, whether they will then. So... It did make uh, a major difference in terms of uh, promises and uh, people's expectations, the sort of issues that came to the fore, dramatically the energy issue. And in terms of contested promises, of course, the Labor Party had said that it wouldn't change the um, Stage 3 tax cuts. Now, it did that for insurance reasons because even though it disagreed with those tax cuts, it didn't want to risk a backlash and losing votes. So it said, OK, we've, we've got those legislated uh, in the previous term and we'll stick with them. Well, of course, as soon as the election passed and circumstances altered, then that became a matter of major debate and uh, will continue to be debated right through, I think, until the next budget. Yes, and as a result of that, uh, I suppose that they find themselves in a situation where they, as you touched on there, they, they fairly quickly were dealing with a massive energy price spike, you know, the, the sort of gas mm -hmm. shortage, and there have been some levers pulled in that, but nothing that's really fundamentally changed the problem. Uh, there was a very explicit promise in the election about gas bill, electricity prices coming down by $275. Um, that hasn't happened. It's gone up probably by about that much. Well, that was, a, that was for some time in the future. Who knows what'll happen. Well, that's right. It wasn't time-specific. No, it was time-specific. Uh, 2025. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I think that nobody thinks that promise is uh, attainable. But more immediately, it's not a case of getting gas prices down from where they were before, but stopping them going up yes, by this yes. enormous amount that was predicted in the budget and the um, government has promised, the Treasurer has promised that uh, there'll be a policy before Christmas and Christmas is coming quite soon and, and Peter <laughs> has some ideas on what might be done. I, I do and, and when because uh, it's one thing to promise something by Christmas but if it needs legislation it has to happen in the uh, the next fortnight, not mm. this week, but um, the next two weeks. Um, it's fairly clear uh, what they'll do, I think, if you read uh, 
uh, Stephen Kennedy's uh, Treasury Secretary's uh, evidence to uh, Senate Committee. What they do will be temporary. He kept using the word temporary. See, um, his view is uh, that, and you, you can see it even with petrol oil price now, that uh, these price rises won't last forever. The, the world oil prices come down. Um, even if the war lasts forever, there'll be other adjustments. The US is made of natural gas, you know, they, they can export it, uh, people will use other things in Europe as uncomfortable as the first winter will be and, and, and so on. So um, the gas prices will come down, uh, it's gas prices that are driving electricity prices, temporary problem, temporary fix. So whatever they do will be time limited, probably two years. Um, uh, and he also made the point that you wouldn't want to fix a problem if it was permanent. Now that sounds odd, but he, he, he used the, the uh, uh, wonderful phrase, the solution to high prices is high prices. So if... if Economics, eh? Hey? Yeah, 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 I know, I know they're like... It. But if... Um, if uh, so, when banana uh, prices shot up because of the cyclone, um, the, the, what that did was encourage us to use other kinds of fruit. It wasn't too difficult, right? Um, uh, but uh, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to deal with the shortage unless the prices had uh, gone up, you know, unless they were to start rationing them, you know, half a banana each. So, uh, you know, and, and this is... Um, uh, you know, a real problem with Britain at the moment because it has uh, set prices, uh, like, uh, energy prices, I think it's gas prices, will be at their pre-existing levels. Well, that's fine until you actually run out. So uh, if you have a genuine shortage, which is permanent, you want high prices to both get new supplies in and, and get, to get people not to use it. But he doesn't think that's the case. Um, he doesn't think you need to wean uh, manufacturers off gas. Victorian manufacturers, you know, set up to use gas because it used to be cheap. He thinks the gas price will pass and therefore something temporary for two years. One thing will be, uh, the, the first step will be saying to the producers who are also the exporters, that is 90% of the East Coast gas supply is controlled by exporters, um, is saying to them, now listen, you're reasonable people and we don't have the legislative power to force you to uh, sell at a certain price. Um, however, we want you to supply enough to East Coast Australia to bring the price back to $10 a gigajoule, which is about where it was, $8. It's going up to 20 right? So we want you to bring that back uh, reasonable and uh, you will do that for us. Uh, if, not, if not, we have other options. Certainly we control export licences and um, you can agree. If they don't agree... Um, and uh, if they don't want to run the sovereign risk of uh, alienating, um, you know, companies by uh, uh, restricting exports, um, then they can do what the British Conservative government, or should I say governments, have done. Multiple, yes. <laughs> and uh, introduce a temporary windfall profits tax and use that to subsidise uh, prices, knowing that uh, it'll be limited for two years and... Uh, Hopefully the gas price will have come down. I think that's what will happen, and uh, if it needs legislation, we'll see it very soon. Yeah, well, we won't get too much further into gas policy because I think it's it's pretty arcane. I, I, all I'd say is that I reckon I'd have the room if I said that um, most people take the view that the largest gas supplier in the world ought to be able to supply its own market with plentiful gas at a reasonable price, and economists or Treasury officials or anyone who's defending the fact that we had no gas reservation policy like they had in WA... Is, uh, is, is essentially... And by the way... It essentially was, defending the indefensible. In it opinion. was the Labor governments of Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard sure, who allowed that. three big export, huge uh, export uh, operations in Queensland to suck gas all the way from the Bass Strait right up north. They had to change the direction yeah. of the Moomba to Sydney Pipeline. They had to make it go the other way. Yeah. Um, I know, but was, this is, this it is was my them point, who it's did allowing that. market forces they to determine public policy. They, <laughs> Labor did that, made the mistake that Labor and WA didn't make without reserving it for Australia. Well, I the think Labor the, 
creation. I think, I think the audience panicked, Peter, when you said the answer to high prices is high prices. Yes, <laughs> yeah. not just the audience. Um, <laughs> let's move on. Let's move on to... Uh, to, to you, you, you touched on this, Michelle, in your opening comments about the, the Prime Minister travelling a lot. How do you think he's performed and, and, and in terms of... Uh, the, uh, the, the relationship rebuilding that he's been doing in a number of places, um, and has, the, has that had a material effect? I mean, he hasn't really had a lot of discretion about many of these things. He hasn't gone to COP27, which is, which is um, you know, sort of raised some eyebrows because climate change has been such mm -hmm. a, a sort of essential tenet of, of Labor's pitch to be elected. Um, and, and, you know, argue, Australia argues that it's back in the game and so forth. But nonetheless, Albanese's d done a lot of travel, almost Whitlam levels of, of travel, perhaps more so, in fact. I don't think he's inspected any ruins, though. He I hasn't seem, been to Easter Island. I seem to remember uh, a lot of uh, ruins and, and other antiquities in That's uh, true, although I'm not sure if that was in the first six months. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, let's, let's go to the question, though. Um, uh, OK. Uh, well, I think that um, just coming to the climate conference first. Uh, obviously, there's a bit of hypocrisy there, given uh, that he uh, really pursued Scott Morrison over whether he'd go to <coughs> COP or not, and he did in the end, of course, not to much avail. But I think that uh, the Prime Minister took the attitude that he really did need to be in Parliament uh, at that time and that the... Climate policy was uh, enough established and uh, Labor had uh, enough cred on that and he had enough cred to to give that a miss safely. So yeah, having joined the peloton effectively of, 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 yeah. of uh, other governments, other countries, it, it, it's less of an issue. It was, a, it was a very much a friction point for Scott Morrison. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so I think that while he got some criticism, it was very limited. To go to the wider question, I think that he's performed well on these various overseas trips. So I mentioned, of course, the current one. But he's also been lucky in that a number of trips were in the pipeline or conferences were coming up at, at the very fortuitous time. So, therefore, a couple of days after the election, he was on the plane to the quad. Well, he was able to... Uh, have talks with the US president, the Indian leader, the Japanese leader, all in one basket, as it were. Mm. That was that was sort of value for money. In, yeah, that's right. <laughs> as it, was it were. Sort of, and speed, then of, speed dating on the international stage. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, of course, there was the Madrid conference yes, and right. another whole clutch of leaders. Mm. And he was able to um, bond with the uh, French president and visit... Rebond. <laughs> Re and visit France and repair that relationship, which of course uh, was very, very bad under under Morrison. And so, and, and now we've had the summit season, and he also did uh, bilateral to Indonesia, which uh, all prime ministers try to do very quickly. And PIF, I think the Pacific and, and Islands. Form. Yes, oh. and the poor Penny Wong has been sort of uh, running around the Pacific almost since. Uh, the Labor government uh, got into office, so she must be suffering from permanent jet lag. But I think that he, in sum, has performed well on these trips and has also been able to uh, have a, a something of a reset of Australian policy. And, of course, he's been much helped by the fact that Labor uh, was uh, known... Uh, the new Labor government was known particularly internationally for its change on climate policy. Mm. And that's been real coinage, I think, in forging international relationships at this very early stage. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. And in fact, in a number of those areas that you mentioned, in terms of you know, bilateral relationships, this climate change issue... There was an idea that the government sort of inherited. The only yes. way it was up, really, yeah, yes. it was sort of go go to these other places and say, look, we've there's a new government, there's a new there's new management in Australia, and we're doing things differently, more consistently with the global consensus. And this was particularly important, of course, in the Pacific. Yes. Although I do think that the relationships in the Pacific are going to be very tricky 
going uh, into the future because clearly China is being assertive in that area and, and talk about strategic competition. Well, what did you have? You had uh, the Australian government promising or giving, not promising, giving guns and, and trucks or some such to uh, the Solomons one day and the next day they were thanking the Chinese for similar sort of equipment, <laughs> a variation on that sort of equipment. So I do think that you're going to see quite a, a lot of longer term difficulty in tr us trying to um, maintain our position as partner of choice. It's a very complicated exercise there. It is, uh, but some of it's about being seen to be trying and that was one of oh, the problems absolutely. that the last government yeah, had. Yeah. It just wasn't seen to be having, you know, there wasn't, the energy just wasn't being put into it, at least that was the perception. Peter, on the, um, on the China question, as Michelle raised there, um, we've, we've had the meeting last night, there's, a, mm. there's, there's this talk of this reset, or at least the beginning of the reset, at least mm. putting the relationship back into at least some talking order, if I can put it like that. Um, how soon do you think there will be economic dividends or, or other dividends that might flow, well, assuming there's some reasonable consistency to the to the ascent path out of the, out of this idea? We've never lost them in the in the. I mean, we've lost wine and you know things like that, but our big export, <laughs> iron ore, has uh, and uh, kept the, the coffers you know, flushed. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not been a problem. Um, the uh, in the same way as. Uh, move it back to domestic politics in the same way as uh, uh, Scott Morrison and Angus Taylor contrived to leave the news about the energy prices to delay that till after the election. China has delayed its economic news till after its Congress. They, mm. they just write to the Statistics Bureau and say, would you mind releasing this a week or so later, same way as we did here. And um, that news is dire. So um, even uh, even in terms of uh, iron ore um, exports, which are basically used to construct cities and so on. China's population uh, this year, uh, its uh, under 65 population uh, is, well, its total population will turn down, and its under 65 uh, population that peaked some time ago is turning down, uh, which means it's not going to need Australian steel uh, like it did. So we, uh, the last time we had a crisis, we relied on demand from China to uh, get us out of it in the global financial crisis. Last few times, actually. Uh, yes, mm. so it's not looking good. Um, uh, having said that, the, 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 the whether they uh, take tariffs, uh, take, uh, you know, I think they pretend they're not special tariffs, they say they're for various reasons, mm. quality of wine or something, I don't know. Uh, wh whether they they take that off or not, the uh, truth is, uh, the Lowy Institute has done stuff on this, that we, we've had far more special tariffs to protect Australian industry, we call them anti-dumping regulations against China than they do against us, and, you know, far more um, than any other, than we do against any other country. Photocopy, paper, you name it, we protect it from China. This, this really annoys them. Um, it, and they're taking us, and we're talking about taking them to the World Trade Organization appellate body, but under Trump, uh, they refuse to appoint people so it doesn't even have a quorum. So that stuff's going to be messy for a year, it, uh, or messy um, for years. Um, the overall picture, though, is we can't rely on China to uh, support Australia's economy as we once did. Um, and all of these, these but, things... But, but, but these, have we, have yeah. we been delivered then some sort of uh, useful message through this process? Because there was forced diversification of markets. Oh, it's been good, you see. Things. We've sold yeah. our wine. Yeah. We've, 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 we've sold all these things to other countries. Yeah. And then the, the suppliers that used to sell to them have sold to China. So mm. th th that's been more an irritant than anything mm. and probably good. You know, what, what do we say about the solution to high prices is high prices? Or, you mm. know, the, the solution <laughs> to... The, the yeah. solution to the diversifying where you sell things is your main customer saying no. So, 
Um, that hasn't affected that us. That said, the, the, one of the things that always gets forgotten in this is you know, we always talk about wheat and barley and iron ore and coal and these sorts of things, but of course services exports are very, 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 very important. Oh, higher my, education. The, the figures, did you see the figures uh, for uh, visitors to Australia uh, this week? No. Shocking. Um, I mean, it's really good. We've got lots of visitors to Australia, uh, you know, as many as we had before COVID, except for one country, China. Yeah. So that's partly their lockdown, you know, yeah. uh, but it's, it seems to be partly a policy of uh, uh, suggesting that their people go elsewhere and starving as the Chinese. And the students, particularly. Yeah. Quite yeah, quite that's right. I mean, students mm. is a very critical part of it. Mm. It's the third largest export uh, industry, um, mm. uh, the export of education. Mind so. you, as we're looking on the bright side of dark things with high prices and so on, I think that um, it has been a bit of a lesson to the universities that they shouldn't over rely on one market yes. or indeed foreign students. Yes, I agree. Although a, a lesson that they've they've had to learn in a in a very in a very mm. quick time, I agree, uh, and a, a practice that was uh, brought about fostered by policy conditions mm. set up mm. in the funding models. Um, let's shift in the time before we go to questions to the opposition um, and talk about. I guess we'll get to Dutton in a moment, but before we get to Peter Dutton, this government term began pretty much, apart from the shock on gas prices, with revelations about Scott Morrison having surreptitiously assumed a whole number of portfolios, which was just one of the most bizarre stories <laughs> that, I, that I've seen. Um, Michelle, what did, what did you make of it? I mean, has it... It's completely sort of dominated his legacy in a sense, hasn't it? Well, it was, as you say, completely bizarre and... I do think, though, more broadly, it goes to his style of leadership, style of um, uh, of government, that uh, we spoke about uh, the helicopter view. Well, Scott Morrison wanted to run everything. He's the opposite complex, of it. Yeah. And thought he knew the answers to everything and um, was a very secretive operator, uh, and, you know, we saw that in uh, the way that uh, the government tried to stop National Cabinet uh, minutes and, and other documents being mm. released. When it lost uh, a, a case in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, it then tried to, to legislate to keep those things secret. That legislation uh, didn't uh, get uh, proceeded with because of the uh, election. But... It just reflects, I think, the Morrison style and all those ministries were the the extreme manifestation of, of that style. They were, and I think one of the most amazing things about them was the, the breach of personal trust with Cabinet colleagues, uh, Frydenberg included. Well, I know. think people like Frydenberg, who was very supportive of Morrison, and we've had uh, stories uh, again in the Sydney Morning Herald this week about how uh, some of the disillusioned colleagues went to Frydenberg and tried to get him to mount a challenge and he stayed loyal to Morrison. I think myself that even if he had become leader, the loss might have been less, but I don't think he would have been able to save the show. But anyway, he remained loyal. Might and have saved his seat, perhaps. Mm, don't know. There was That was very mm. strong in the end. Mm. Surprisingly strong, but very... Yes. We haven't Please. actually got to that cross bench, and we should do so very quickly. So why don't we? But uh, I do think that uh, just to finish that point, yeah. I think that Frydenberg was really sort of completely shocked yes. that he'd been treated like that because it was pretty bad. Yes, and he was definitely collateral damage in a in, in a swing away from Morrison in that election. Mm. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that there weren't other good reasons to, for you know, for. for but the uh, uh, what, what I mean is the secret ministry yes, thing yes. because. Morrison had sworn himself in as treasurer. And, and Frydenberg did not know. Yeah. No, no, he no. didn't know until afterwards. And neither and did Birmingham, who was, was the finance minister. I mean. amazed and <laughs> flabbergasted. Yeah, uh, astonishing. Um, let's quickly go to Peter Dutton. Um, what's your assessment uh, of Peter Dutton uh, in terms of the way he's performed? He, he came in with uh, a strongman image, all that sort of stuff. His first press conference was pretty feisty, I thought, in the sense of saying there was no sort of you know, we acknowledge the message the Australian voters have delivered. There was no apology of, of that kind at all. Um, there was almost a, a sense that he, he was saying, um, 
we're not even going to worry about trying to get those community independent seats back. We're going to go for the outer, the, uh, our supporters in the outer suburbs, you know, the tradies and so forth. Well, I think he's really got a nearly impossible job uh, on the history. The person who inherits this situation doesn't last to be prime minister. <coughs> he's uh, came in with a, a bad image and it's very hard to shift that. He's got a, a situation where the coalition stretches from from the right, from the hard right through to the what's left of the moderates, not many, but nevertheless uh, that's a, a constituency and they do need to get back some of those teal seats. I think there's a general recognition. I do think that in his day-to-day -day performance since the election, he's not done so badly, that uh, he's trying to keep the show together and has managed so far to do that. Of course, uh, cost of living issues help him too. He's, he's got some issues to run on. So um, I, I think that his underlying situation is incredibly difficult and probably impossible, but his actual immediate performance is about, about as good as... Um, it could be it, from, the, from where he, he started. He can make it. Yeah. And I would make one final point that I do think he's, he is much disliked and ridiculed and so on in, in the electorate. But I think as a person... Um, he's rather different and uh, more personable than that. Yes, I would agree with that from personal experience. And, and it was quite telling, Peter, that he was more popular in the party room, really, than Morrison was. Even at the time Morrison was selected as leader back when they got rid of Turnbull, uh, the view was, because it was, in fact, Dutton that challenged Turnbull, you might recall, back in 2018. Mm. Uh, but they went to Morrison as the sort of save the furniture candidate at that point. Um, but if you asked MPs in the party room, they, they, they liked Dutton more. They just thought that Morrison was, was less offensive to the electorate, going to Michelle's point. So, yeah. interesting yeah. decision. Yeah, indeed. And more, uh, I think the colleagues would also trust Dutton more. Yes. Well, uh, I, even, even, quite rightly. Well, I even uh, <laughs> not looking at it in retrospect, I think even... Even during the last term, if, if you'd ask people, you mm. know, who, yes. who was more trustworthy, I think that they'd see uh, Dutton as someone who did what he believed, said what he believed, whereas Morrison, it's whatever it takes. Yes. It was whatever it takes. Uh, we'll go to questions after this final question. Um, so I'll just uh, raise the, 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 the issue of the independence, the community independence, or some call them the teals. Um, any reflections from either of you on how they are performing? Are they performing as you would have imagined, perhaps to you first, Michelle? Um, well, I think we should see the Teals as a subcategory of community independence. Mm -hmm. uh, remember that perhaps Cathy McGowan was the, the model for community independence and, and has driven a lot of the movement, including the, the Teals, in terms of helping them and, and sort of making sure that that network had information. As to how they're performing, um, one interesting thing is that the vote on the industrial relations legislation in the House of Reps where the community, the, the teal independents don't count in terms of the outcome, but that sort of split in those teal MPs. So I think that that shows that on issues outside their core issues, which was climate change, integrity, um, women's equality, uh, they are uh, somewhat diverse and that'll be interesting in, in the time to come. Uh, a sort of uh, teal affiliate, if I can call him that, is, uh, of course, David Pocock. Not, not exactly a, a, a teal, but nevertheless into heavily into teal issues. And, of course, he has become absolutely pivotal, will be pivotal on IR, as far as we can see, and uh, that, that'll that be interesting how he uh, plays it over the next 
couple of years. Yeah. And things would be completely different. Uh, it, just after the election, it looked as if the Teals would, uh, you know, hold the balance of power. Then they would be people who are under a lot of pressure. Uh, then they would get lots of resources because what they did mattered. They didn't get uh, the staff and all eyes would be on them. But as it happened, Labor got that extra seat and uh, the Teals, which are all in the House of Representatives, you know, the real Teals, the, uh, the female uh, MPs, are, um, uh, well, I suppose they're, they're not very important. Uh, people don't seek their views on things. It's, it's not how it might have been. Yes, it's interesting, but they've had a, a fairly big effect on the political atmosphere and the agenda that is being pursued, particularly in relation to women's issues, particularly in relation to integrity and, and, and of course, in mm. driving, putting a bit of steel in the spine of the major parties, or at least one of them, in respect of climate change. And the government's polite to them. The government is polite to them. Yeah. Because it they goes exist out of its way to be polite Because they exist as a buffer. I mean, yep. it's very hard to see how Dutton gets to 76 seats, which is the yep. number he needs for a majority, if he doesn't get those seats back. So Labor might not have you know, too many over 76 itself, in fact, one. Um, but it does have those teals sitting there as a sort of a raft of protection, human shield, perhaps, um, <laughs> between them and, uh, and, and Morrison if uh, things turn south for the government. Do we have a raised hand for anyone wanting to ask? We have one at the back uh, up there, just to... Yes, um, if you could just uh, um, wait till you get... Mike, good on you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to focus on one initially. Um, great conversation. Um, stage three tax cuts, very controversial, but could they potentially be seen as a step to further tax reform? Because as in Australia, I'm not sure if many are aware, 90% of individual tax returns return a benefit. So doesn't that indicate that perhaps the taxation system's wrong? Shouldn't we be refocusing maybe not collecting taxation from individuals and more to companies, like so perhaps a stage three tax return where there's more a level playing field on your taxation rate could lead to reform in, you know, GST or company tax or other areas. So perhaps it's not the enemy that people are seeing it as. It could actually be the first step towards some actual reform in one of the most complex taxation systems in the world. Two okay. things uh, on, on that. Uh, one is that I think they will amend the stage three, and uh, I think what they'll do is spend roughly the same amount of money on it, but say, well, look, uh, we're going to make it a bit fairer. It is outrageous and indefensible that someone on $200,000 gets a tax cut of $9,000. That cannot be defended, and um, it, it's easy to make that case if you say, well, you know, we're actually looking after the people below that. So I, th I think they'll do something like that. And they've got actually beyond the next budget to do it. It, it doesn't take effect till mid-2024, um, by which time the heat will have gone out of that promises issue. The, the more general thing, and Frydenberg has said he wants to start a... Frydenberg. Chalmers. Chalmers has said he wants to start a conversation about um, how much revenue we need is uh, probably, uh, as a result of some process... Uh, it, they'll realise that for all of the things that I don't need to, to list, um, but a lot of them are, are to do with ageing, uh, health, um, uh, the government needs more money. And um, he will look at things which are not income tax. There are many of them. Some of them are tax on superannuation, right? Um, uh, uh, you know, some of them are uh, some kind of amendment to the GST, perhaps. Um, uh, company tax, a form of uh, super profits tax or changing the nature of company tax. We are overweight in income tax compared to other countries. We're way underweight on consumption tax and uh, we're uh, underweight on other things. Uh, we, you know, we don't have death duties, we don't have land tax, we don't have wealth tax. So those will be the kind of things, I think, uh, that we'll see. But... Um, I think that what will happen is we'll have the conversation in this term of politics and uh, a bit like how it did with the GST, big changes will be put to an election. Yes, well, that's definitely the way to, um, yeah. to do it, to actually seek a mandate. I mean, and it, how it was long, a risk for Howard, but... Uh, but how long since someone failed to win re-election for a second term? Long 1931. Time. Right. Yeah. Mind you, Howard came pretty close. That's now, true. They, that's an interesting point. They all come pretty close. I mean... 
Hawke did in 84, lost, lost ground in 84. Every single government, you know, Labor did in 2010. Um, uh, you know, th this coalition did again in 2016, or the coalition we just had in 2016. Uh, so, yes, they all go backwards, it seems, a little bit. The, the thing about this Labor government is it doesn't have any room to go backwards, really, before it's into minority territory. So, yeah, it will be interesting to see how that affects everything. Cathy, we have a... Um, uh, a question from one of the people participating online. I'll get you to read that out. And uh, after that, we might have time for one more question if we get our answer is to be uh, yeah, very perfunctory. Sure. So the question online is, how do you see the movement for diversity in politics progressing? And will it be beneficial overall for our biggest challenges? Michelle? Well, I think this um, is a very interesting question because... Clearly, uh, these days, uh, the whole pressure for diversity and diverse representation is very, very strong and uh, represented in the whole shift to identity politics. But I also think it's going to be a challenge for the society to balance diversity, identity politics with... Uh, also pursuing uh, a unified um, a unified culture, a unified commitment is, is a better way of putting it, uh, keeping the uh, society united on common values and, in a broad sense, common directions. And I guess a, a, a challenge that is approaching is how to manage the voice referendum between uh, the uh, case for the um, First Nations people to, to have uh, much more influence and for that to be formalised through the Constitution, which I think has widespread support and ought to have widespread support. But in order to get that through, I think the argument will need to be pursued along the lines of how this is positive in terms of the wider community and uniting the wider community. So that will be a, a, a very um, early and material test of this uh, diversity within unity um, tension challenge, if you like. Yeah, I think it's a very good point. Do we have uh, another question from the floor? Uh, we have one just down the front here, and I think we've got another one there. We'll try and sneak both in if we can, unless I'm countermanded in some way. OK, so, um, just a question. Like, in, in Australian politics, on both sides of the spectrum, there's very fractious relationships between the political parties, including between, say, Albanese and the Greens and the Teals. On the other side of the Pacific in Chile, there's a very different set of political relationships where you've got a president elected by a coalition of parties four parties in the inner cabinet and about ten parties in the outer cabinet all sort of working together. And to give a real sense of the kind of relationships, they have a, a minister there who's responsible as a, for the overall communication between the government and the public and the official spokesperson of the president. And so the president's in one political party and he's appointed a leader from another political party to be his official spokesperson which strikes me as a really incredible relationship of trust backwards and forwards across two political parties and their leaders. And I say that that's very, very different from what goes on in Australia. And so it's sort of a question, of, is there a potential lessons there for Australian politics that people can build those sorts of coalition relationships? Do you want to take that or should well, I? I think it's more your territory, <laughs> uh, Michelle. Well, but can I just say this? Uh, first, which is that I think there are a few things that define Australia. Uh, by that I mean the, the national sort of uh, uh, Australia, which is uh, 120 years old. And um, one is um, we like big government, we like being looked after. But another one is we have this big role for labour, uh, for unions, organised labour, and although they're... No, not as many members of unions. It's still sort of there. And that's given us this, as it did in Britain, uh, this sort of, well, that's not quite two-party, but almost, this two-party system. And I, th I think it would need a lot to sort of 
chip away at that. I think it's sort of, you know, it's quite important in our foundation and we haven't had that many generations since. Mm. I, I, I agree. I think that um, the, the multi-party system, I know we've got a coalition, but the multi-party system is uh, not in our uh, DNA, DNA. multi-governing parties and I can't see it changing. It's a really interesting uh, point though because I suppose one response to it is to say that all polities have their own that all functioning ones have their own ways, their own sort of automatic stabilisers within them, uh, norms and traditions that, that provide stability. And Michelle and I have just been uh, talking about this in recent days. We have compulsory voting and, uh, you know, the, the, the mm. secret ballot and these sorts of things that, that uh, became very strong in Australia. And yes, we have an adversarial system in as much as the way the parties confront each other in Parliament. Um, and perhaps that's where we find our stability such as it is. So we might have an outward culture of hostility, but the net result in governing terms, uh, I think we'd have to say over that 120 odd years, is of remarkable stability, peaceful transitions of power, uh, and, and broadly speaking, budgets that, um, that, 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 you know, that make sense, and, uh, and, and not egregious levels of, of corruption over time. Um, do we have any uh, further questions? We had one. Did we have, we have one? Yeah, we did have one. Uh, oh, you've um, uh, withdrawn? Uh, okay. Uh, no other questions at this stage? Do we want to... Um, do we... Are we how, how much time have we got left, Kathy? We've got about two minutes. <laughs> um, do, do you want to just say one, anything more about The Voice? Because we haven't... I mean, you, you've... Yeah. It, it, it is a really interesting moment for sort of national completion, isn't it? Mm. Do you want to start? No, you start. <laughs> Um, well, I do think that The Voice is a, a very important um, challenge for the government and for the community. If Albanese succeeds, succeeds in getting this referendum through, I think it'll be the most important social reform thing he does uh, in this term. But it is... A very hard thing to do, and uh, everyone here knows uh, to get it through, it's got to be a, a majority of the states as well as the overall majority, and and that is a challenge. I think the uh, fact that the um, Indigenous leaders are not all united is uh, another thing that, uh, an obstacle that's going to be have to be overcome. I, do, I also believe that the government will have to and should give detail. I don't think you can sort of say, well, you have more chance if you don't have detail. And um, I don't think that's how democracy should work, frankly. So even though it's harder, perhaps, if you give detail, I think there's an obligation to do that. And uh, going back to the point I was making earlier about diversity within unity, I think that the voice needs to be sold, including by the Indigenous leadership, in a positive way, not in a, a backward-looking way. We all understand dispossession and, and um, the immense grievances that uh, many First Nations people feel, but I think to get this across the line, it needs to be seen as a moment of affirmation and national unity. Yeah, as it, as it was in 67. Can I ask you a question, Michelle? Well, we, Final... we have about 30 <laughs> seconds. So okay. let's make What's the answer to this question? If it fails, tell me wh what you the landscape you see after that. Well, if it fails, I think it will be seen as uh, just an incredible disappointment and something of an indictment on society. I don't think it's sort of... Uh, the end of everything, but we saw with the the, um, uh, end of the, Republic. the Republic that it didn't come... Well, it still hasn't come back. So it, it means uh, that nothing is done for a long time. I think it would be very bad for Australia internationally. I think it would be devastating for many uh, Indigenous people. And basically, if it fails, it'll be very, very bad. Okay. Yes, well, um, I'm sorry, I was just having a sort of OJ conversation about whether we keep going. Are you saying I can keep going? Yep, okay. Um, let, let's 
while we're doing that, let's then go back to Peter Dutton because we, one of the things we always talk about, we talk about the need for a supermajority, a majority of votes in a majority of states and so forth, uh, yeah, the overall majority. But of course, the other big thing that's always said about referendums is that the, the controversial ones is they need the support of both sides of politics to have any chance of getting up. Um, there's been eight uh, out of 44 questions that have been supported since uh, the Constitution's been around. Only one of them has been put by a Labor government. This is something that's, uh, you know, mm. not widely known. It's very difficult to do. Peter Dutton is a little bit equivocal about this at the moment. He has his own record on it. We don't know where, um, where he's going to land. It is possible of the sort of three options he has, opposing it, supporting it officially, or allowing his members to do whatever they want on it. Um, of those three, it seems most likely that the last one is the one he might go for. Now, that is a sort of, in my mind, and I'll put it to both of you, in my mind that is a, a sort of a Clayton support and it may function as effectively opposition because you would have, mm. have you know, several and representative senior members of the coalition arguing against this, this constitutional change. And um, along with a few Indigenous leaders who might be, uh, you know... Um, swimming in the other direction, as it were, from it. Uh, you know, does that represent a serious danger? And I suppose wrapped up in that is, was Albanese in that sense potentially hasty about this? Well, I think that does represent a serious danger, but I think you've also got to recognise the limits to a leader's authority. And it may be that uh, Peter Dutton has to take that Clayton's road, as you describe it, because there is no choice because there would be a significant uh, group within the coalition that would oppose it, and he's got the problem also of his high-profile new Indigenous senator opposing it strongly. So, uh, really, he is in a very difficult position and an invid invidious position if he uh, would prefer to uh, yeah. support it. But this is awful. And by the way, this is true, because Malcolm Turnbull has, rec has seen this twice, the limits to a coalition leader's authority. Um, he's lost his job twice because he tried to go ahead of them. But this is awful, and this tends to suggest it won't pass. And, you know, it's bad for Albanese because it's, it's the one thing he's put his sort of stamp on. But um, for people who think that it will complete and sort of stabilise Australia, um, it's awful, right? <laughs> well, I, it is. I, think, um, I think we also should recognise, well, as I say, I think the voice should uh, ought to pass, um, not saying it will pass, but it, it would be beneficial for it to pass. I think we should also realise that it's not some magic answer to all the problems of Indigenous Australia. I don't know whether or how many of you might have seen the Four Corners problem, uh, the Four Corners program this week about the uh, treatment of um, uh, young people in uh, detention in correctional institutions, mainly in Western Australia, also the Northern Territory. But you're not going to get instant answers to these issues just because you have the voice. You might get uh, better input to policy, broader input, but these are very intractable issues that are going to require um, really... Uh, they're wicked problems. They are wicked in, problems. In policy sense, they are wicked but problems. But empowerment and a feeling of power um, helps. Um, it may help, but in it, its own right, it it's doesn't worth something. solve. No. As we remember with ATSIC, which had actually a lot of power, both representative True. power and executive power, and 
how much progress was made. Sure. Not a lot. Sure. Well, there was some. And, but let's not forget also that the, a critical part of the voice is the constitutional enshrinement, the recognition in the constitution of the unique status of First Nations peoples who were here before we came and uh, uh, whose land was taken and who, uh, against whom countless atrocities were made. And, and the recognition of that, as, as I think Peter's touching on, I know you, you agree with this, so I'm not trying to convince you, but... The, uh, the recognition factor in it is a critical first step. And yes, those problems are, are wicked and, and, and there are many of them, but um, uh, it's a, it's a gesture. Having been raised, the, re the, the rejection of that yes. as, a, as an approach... Would, would be bad. Is, is would a, be is very a, yes. bad. But um, can we take a question from the audience? We have one in the middle here. Um, we'll just get a microphone to you, sir, if we can. Or, uh, we, um, it, it's... it's well, I can, but it's about whether people online, you know, whether the recording picks it up. So um, I may have, um, you know, sort of, to use a Malbruff comment, embuggered the, uh, the process a bit by this, because <coughs> it yes, seems like... Someone that is getting a microphone. Yes. Um, Shall we go with the, uh, with the... We'll go with the acoustic version, shall we? Oh, look, I'll tell you what, you ask the question, I'll repeat it. Yeah. Yep, good. Oh, here we go. We've got a microphone coming to you now. <laughs> All we had to do was sort of faff around for a while and, uh, and the microphone would uh, come to the middle there, maybe past the parcel or something. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want it turned on as well? Uh, <laughs> just tap, it. tap it, yeah. All right, just, just, just ask the question and I'll uh, reframe it for people if they haven't heard it. The question is, <laughs> has to do with Australia's unique federal structure. Mm -hmm. And the issue raised, you mentioned it, Western Australia and the Northern Territory and perhaps Queensland, which is where the, where the deep problems are in relation to the First Peoples. Why can't we find a way to get those state governments to solve their problems? Okay, so the question is, why can't we get the states that, that have significant problems? This is in the Indigenous Affairs space. Uh, why can't we get those states to do more about solving their problems? Funnily enough, that was one of the reasons why the 67 referendum got up so well, is because the states hmm. wanted to sort of hand over responsibilities for for uh, for in, you know First Nations populations within their within their uh, jurisdictions. Um, so what, what's the answer there? I mean, the, the well, I federalism think bedevils everything in this country anyway. Uh, yes, but it's not, it's not really... It, the federal system, I don't think, is... Um, the culprit. The, ..is why we can't solve these problems, because, as you say, there is federal government power as well. I think it is because they are wicked problems. They are just incredibly difficult to solve because there are so many elements involved. There's quite a lot of money around, but money is not getting to the, the heart of uh, finding solutions. Yeah, but the, the, the states are why. Um, we've got this peculiarity with the uh, Commonwealth Grants Commission. You know, it, it divides up the GST according to population, and then it gives a huge weighting to one state, it's actually the Northern Territory, right? It gives a huge weighting. It gets three times what it would on, on the basis of, you know, the small amount of GST that's collected in the Northern Territory because of its indigenous population. So that's what we do. And then it doesn't spend it on the indigenous population. It doesn't spend anything like all of it on that. If you go to the Northern Territory uh, Parliament House, you'll see it's about as grand as ours. It spends it on other things. So um, it's a really big anomaly and if I were redesigning the process of distributing money to the states, I would say, well, uh, we gave it to you for this. We're not going to give it to you for this. We're going to do, as the Commonwealth now has, you know, since 67 has power to do, we're going to spend it uh, on Indigenous... Uh, uh, rectification, indigenous programs ourselves. Um, this, I just, and, but so that's the, that's the, the sort of uh, financial structure. But uh, what it indicates, I think, is that the Northern Territory and Western Australia really 
don't regard that as a high priority. In other words, I think you're right, um, and uh, 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 you know, I, I, I don't think it's only that these are wicked problems. I think it's that they're problems that don't matter to the people in charge as much as they should uh, in those states. But also, you have the complication that uh, if, for example, if you take some of the uh, remote communities, at one level, it's desirable and the people involved in them, the people living in them, want to preserve them, want to, to continue the way of life in them. But then that runs counter to wanting to give every individual equal opportunity because mm. even if you put a lot more services into those communities, uh, a child who is born into one of those communities is not going to, in practical terms, have as much opportunity as your children have here in Canberra. You, you just cannot get that playing field equal. So That's ha also true. How, do yeah. you, how do you balance those things? How do you get opportunities for those children while also preserving the communities and the way of life that those communities want. And, I mean, that's just one small example of how the wicked problem works out in practice. Yes, absolutely. So, Cathy. So, th thank you for joining us here on site and online. We've gone from high prices to wicked problems to some intractable solutions in what has been a very stimulating conversation. For those who are with us uh, in the building, I hope you can join us in the foyer for more conversation, where our panellists have kindly agreed to sign some books. Thank you again, and we hope to see you back at the library soon. Have a lovely evening, and for those in Canberra, stay warm.